Unterweger calling. I've, I've had to disappear because the police want to throw me back in jail. They have absolutely no evidence against me. They're under pressure, but they don't have a good suspect. So because of my past, they're trying to hang it on me. So I'm going to remain in hiding. His girlfriend was the only person who knew where Unterweger was. Bianca Marac had got a job in Switzerland. I think I'd been working there for about 10 days when he visited me and told me everything. He broke down and told me that he was wanted for the murder of 10 prostitutes. He kept saying it wasn't me, it wasn't me. How could they think it was me? I was pretty shocked, but I wanted to believe him at the same time. I didn't know what to do. I only knew that I didn't want to go through it on my own, because I was afraid of what would happen to me. I told him we should either drive back to Vienna together, or I would go with him wherever he wanted to go. Convinced he wouldn't get a fair trial, Unterweger and Bianca went on the run. An international manhunt quickly traced them to Miami in Florida after they tried to get money sent to them. Jack Unterweger was arrested. Detective Fred Miller flew from Los Angeles to interview the man suspected of 10 prostitute murders. He's very relaxed, uh, very self-confident, almost cocky. We sat down with him and spoke with him for probably two hours. We had an interpreter with us, and we asked him whether he'd like to speak German or English. Yes, I'd prefer to speak English. He admitted to being in Los Angeles. He admitted to staying at the Cecil Hotel, and that he did, while at the Cecil Hotel, have uh, sex with several prostitutes. Two of the victims had last been seen near the Cecil Hotel. Miller felt sure Unterweger must be the killer. We wanted to prosecute him here, and we were given total help from the Austrians, they would do everything they could to help us obtain a prosecution in California because California had a death penalty. Where in Austria, they do not. But Miller only had circumstantial evidence. Unterweger had been in L.A. at the time of the murders. The district attorney's office in Los Angeles County decided not to file because they didn't think they could get, could get a, a conviction of Jack on the small uh, bit of evidence that we did have. Unterweger had escaped a possible death penalty. It was up to the Austrian authorities to prove he had killed all ten women. But now, they had the help of the FBI. The FBI were very experienced in serial killers. And what we needed uh, was an expert to link the cases in Europe together with the cases in, in L.A. FBI experience has identified a pattern in serial murders known as the killer's crime signature. The signature in a series of crimes uh, may or may not always be there, but when it is there, it is a, sort of a constellation of behaviors uh, that are consistent from crime to crime to crime. It, it's like a personality print, if you will, much like a fingerprint that has ridges and loops and, and all of that. We're looking for a personality print uh, at the scene that may carry over from one scene to another to another. McCrary examined all the crime scene information. Each victim had been strangled, and each time, the same complex slipknot had been used. This point was the, uh, not just a ligature strangulation, which we have in, in other cases, but that the knots were tied in exactly the same way, in an intricate manner, but the same way. Again, what are the chances that random people are going to not only do a ligature strangulation, but tie the knot in exactly the same way? Not very, uh, not very likely at all that we'd have more than one offender. So that became a critical uh, piece of evidence that linked these, uh, linked these crimes together. The knot was the killer's crime signature. The FBI had shown that the same person killed all ten victims, but they couldn't say who that person was. If the Austrians could link Unterweger to just one of the murders, they could charge him with all of them. But they still didn't have a piece of evidence that proved his guilt. You can imagine a guy sitting in jail. He knows that there are cops all over the world, cops and forensic people all over the world that are 
building their case against him. So every day he's sitting there in jail wondering, well, what are they finding? Um, what, what, what case are they building against me? So I think it was extremely stressful. Unterweger Vega tried to cut his wrists. The suicide attempt brought him support. I felt obliged to tell him to stick it out. So I wrote an encouraging letter. I said, Herr Unterweger, there are still people who haven't prejudged you. Don't give up. The police weren't giving up either. Knowing that Unterweger traveled, they contacted Interpol. Do we have any other suspicious cases out of Austria that maybe can be connected or maybe are connected to the murder cases in Austria? We knew that Jack Unterweger hadn't just traveled in Austria. We knew that he'd also been to Germany, to Italy, and to Czechoslovakia. So of course we made inquiries in all those countries as to whether any women or prostitutes had been murdered around that time. And that is how we found out about the murder of Blanka Bochkova in Prague. The Czech authorities had been investigating the 1990 murder of Blanka Bochkova for two years. She wasn't a prostitute, but had been found strangled with her bra in a wood. Jack Unterweger had been in a restaurant 500 meters away from where she was last seen. It was just three months after his release from prison. It became clear that, that their prime suspect was, was in each of these cities at the time that the murders occurred. So either he's the unluckiest guy in the world or something going on. We're on the right track. The search for proof intensified. We established that Unterweger had owned a number of different cars but that he sold them on. So I said to my men, go on and search for vehicles, even if they've been sold on. Maybe we'll find something. The car Unterweger had driven to Prague had been sold as spare parts, but the Austrian police tracked down the seats. They had lain in a garage for nearly two years. On one of the seats, three hairs were found. Manfred Hochmeister tested the hairs to see if the DNA matched Blanka Bochkova. In April 93, we started to extract human DNA from these hairs. And we could only extract nine billionths of a gram of DNA, which is a very, very small amount. Hochmeister looked for the genetic markers which make up a DNA profile. In a series of experiments, he tested the DNA. Each time, the accuracy of the profile increased. In the final test, using the last of the hair sample, Hochmeister found that the DNA matched just one in 2.1 million women. It matched Blanka Bochkova. The hair was microscopically identical to the victim's head hairs and it matched in nine genetic markers and it was a female hair which was found under his car seat. I think it was a very very powerful piece of information but of course it was not the proof. The result placed Bochkova in Unterweger's car. Once again it was circumstantial evidence. It didn't prove that he killed her. But it was all the police had. Jack Vega was charged with the murder of 11 women in three countries. But would the evidence stand up in court? Jack Unterweger, once a reformed prisoner and the darling of society, was accused of murdering 11 women in Austria, Czechoslovakia and Los Angeles. It was Austria's trial of the century. The world's press crammed into the court to see the man suspected of being the first serial killer in modern Austrian history. Jack was certainly a very powerful personality and a very powerful presence and a lot of charisma. His personality just sort of filled the courtroom and he was, he was a presence.
you do get the sense that he was that he was enjoying it. I think also he understood that my only real chance to get out of this is to use all of my charm, all of my charisma on the jury. The evidence the jury heard was circumstantial. He had no alibi for the murders in Los Angeles, Austria and Prague. Fibers and DNA showed that two victims had been with him when they were alive. But there was no single piece of evidence proving his guilt. That was his argument, that, that you don't have any evidence. All you can say is that, that I was always there, that I don't have an alibi, that, but, but this, this isn't sufficient to link me with these, these crimes. The FBI's Greg McCrary gave his evidence. He didn't think Kunta Vega had a strong defense. Circumstantial evidence is still evidence. It's the totality of the evidence that you have to look at. And the question many time investigators or jurors have to ask themselves is, what are the chances we could have all of these circumstances and this person not be the killer and not be responsible for the crime? And that's, that's really how circumstantial evidence should be, um, should be used. Unter Vega knew the stakes were high. On the day of the verdict, he looked ashen-faced. I was going to smile, to give him some encouragement, but he just looked back really serious. The eight-member jury had the final say. Up until the last minute he thought it could, it could go either way. It, it, it all hinges on two of the jury members. He had a sense that four are really against me, two are with me, and two aren't sure. The verdict was returned. Jack Unterweger was found guilty. He was sentenced to life with no chance this time of parole. In Austria, a majority verdict is enough. Two jury members believed Unterweger was not guilty. In America, in America, he would have walked away a free man. Because in America, verdicts have to be unanimous. I personally don't think he was guilty. I am convinced that he did not commit those crimes. He was definitely not a perverted serial killer type. Kein perverser Serienmörder Typ. Rudolf Prem was convinced of Unterweger's guilt. But the jury had found Unterweger not guilty of killing Prem's wife Regina or Elfriede Schrempf. Their skeletal remains meant cause of death was unproven. What he did to the others, he did to Regina. I don't understand it. It's too much for me. For me, he's a sick person. He is sick and should never have been released from prison. Bianca Marac knew Jack Unterweger best. She had broken off contact with him before his trial. She had discovered his public charm hid a darker side. He was very jealous. He was a control freak. He was domineering. He constantly wanted to know what I was thinking, what I was doing, where I was. But even though he had treated her badly, Bianca isn't sure of his guilt. She isn't sure if she was to be his next victim. On one hand, I say, I may be the one girl that got away or just made it in time. On the other hand, I'm sure he wouldn't have done anything to me. I'm split myself because I don't know. I don't think he killed them all. But then, I don't think that someone is sentenced for a murder he hasn't committed. Nine hours after the verdict, Unterweger killed himself. He had always claimed there was no evidence against him, until he died. The knot he used for his own noose matched those of the 11 victims. The best evidence, of course, is his self-killing. He killed himself in the same way as he killed the women. And this is evidence enough. <laughs>